Hello and welcome to Ghastly Tales. I'm Michael Whitehouse and it's my pleasure to share another frightening story with you on this episode. But before we begin, I was wondering if you could do me a little favour. I'm so grateful to all of you who take the time to listen to the Ghastly Tales podcast on YouTube or on your podcast app of choice. If you enjoy the show, it would be fantastic if you could take the time to review Ghastly Tales on your podcast app of choice and to subscribe to our YouTube channel at both will really help the show continue to grow. I know the vast majority of you listen to the show as a podcast, but the Ghastly Tales YouTube channel has 10 years of stories, documentaries, short horror films and discussions that myself and my friends Callum, Martin and Alan have continued to upload throughout the years. It would be great to have you join us, especially as we just passed 25,000 subscribers and uh, feel we're just getting warmed up. A review on your podcast app will mean the show is recommended to more listeners and by subscribing to our YouTube channel, you'll be able to interact with us directly and be part of our fantastic horror community there. It's a cosy corner of the internet, so join us at youtube.com forward slash ghastly tales or click the link in the show notes for this episode and maybe you'll stay for a while maybe you'll stay forever now enough of the shameless plugging let's get to tonight's story i wrote this one a few months ago and i'm delighted to sit down with you now and tell the tale so dim the light make sure there's nothing behind you and let's venture into The Flood Beneath by Michael Whitehouse The door to the cellar was never to be touched. At least that was what my dad had always said. He told us this was because we lived near to a river. The foundations of the house sometimes flooded and this seeped into the cellar, making it dangerous down there. When it was at its worst, he told us the spaces between the house would fill up with several feet of water, and that for my sister and me, a trip down there would be fatal. I used to shudder at the thought of the water and the dark down there, mixing together into a black liquid, fingering its way beneath the floorboards a silent intruder wetting the very foundations of our lovely home, ready to bring it down at any moment. I used to have nightmares about the water rising up through the floor, drowning me in my sleep. Looking back, it wasn't so strange that I focused on disturbed thoughts like that around that time. Her mother had died of cancer a few years earlier, and ever since then I had always expected the worst outcome in every situation. Of course, my dad said that, as long as I stayed out of the cellar, my fears about the water were unwarranted. He told me not to worry, that he would have the problem fixed soon enough, though it might mean people would be coming and going from the house for a while. I remember the first day the men came to fix the problem. I was only 11 years old at the time and my sister Heather was seven. We both watched three men dressed in unusual grimy yellow suits of rubber and their faces covered in masks and goggles make their way to the cellar door. My dad had told me to make myself scarce while they worked. I was to play with Heather in the back garden, but I didn't listen. I stood behind the door of the kitchen at the end of our hall and watched the three men in rubber yellow suits open the cellar door. Heather peeked out from behind me, her red locks of hair hiding the rest of her face. She seemed more frightened of being caught by her dad than anything else, for not doing as he asked. But that wasn't what frightened me. The thought of the black water down there was enough to do that on its own. I just wanted it gone so I could stop being consumed with worry. The men closed the door behind them 
We watched as my dad stood there at the cellar door. He was looking at his watch. He seemed agitated. But what got under my skin was the smell that made its way to us at the end of the hallway. The cellar door had been open only for a few moments, but it was enough for a disgusting, putrid stench to escape and make its way to our noses. I cupped my hand over my mouth and nose in disgust, but Heather let out a loud yuck. Dad spun around in our direction. I remember he looked paler than usual, but he didn't seem angry. He walked to the end of the hallway and told us in a gentle voice, Right, my little spies, go and play while this gets taken care of. He looked at the old brown leather wristwatch he always wore, as if time were against him. Heather asked if the men would make that horrible smell go away. He said they would, but it would take time. I took Heather by the hand and we went out to the garden to play in the sun after that, just as Dad had instructed. The men came to fix the cellar more than once. These visits continued for a while on and off. Machinery was brought into our home. Long rubber hoses for pumping out the black water from down in the darkness. I remember seeing two of the men standing over the hose with their masks off outside. They were shaking their heads and it seemed there was some disagreement about the best course of action but I didn't hang around long enough to understand it all. I was a kid, and there was playing to be had. Dad later explained to us that the men had to pump out the water, then dry out the cellar with machines called dehumidifiers, and then they would try to fix the walls so the water wouldn't get in. But regardless of their efforts, the flooding kept happening. Although he tried to be outwardly calm, Dad seemed increasingly consumed by the situation. I could see the dark patches under his eyes getting more pronounced as the days wore on and the worry seeping into his posture. It wasn't unusual for him to have dark moods. He'd understandably seemed weighed down ever since my mother had died. But the flooding brought with it another cold weight to add to his burdens. It seemed that he was desperate to fix the problem. Eventually we were told that the men looking into the issue would have to dig up the back garden to try and put in drainage. Dad explained that this was to stop the water from getting to the foundations of the house in the first place. Around that time I overheard him talking to one of our neighbours, Mrs Reed telling her that if he couldn't make the water go away, he'd have to take me and Heather away from our home. That house was the only home I'd ever known, and so the mere mention of being taken from it created a warped feeling of instability that I know I never quite shook. Mrs Reed seemed very concerned when talking to my dad, more so than seemed reasonable, but she whispered as she spoke to him and so I didn't catch her side of the conversation. At night I'd lie in bed and dream about the black water underneath my bedroom, swirling around out of sight. Sometimes I'd waken, a loud splash of water dragging me out of a terrible dream, and then there would be nothing but silence. In the dream, the water had a voice. This seemed to go on for weeks, as far as I recall, until one night I was woken up by something else. Something worse. I was jolted from my sleep by the sound of a scream. I knew immediately that it was my dad's voice. At first I wasn't sure if the scream had been part of a nightmare, like the water seeping past the threshold to my waking mind. But this thought was answered quickly. The scream came again. A few moments later, more panicked and agonised than before. After that, it stopped. Dad's bedroom was next to ours, but it didn't sound like the scream had come from there. It sounded like it had come from somewhere constrained, somewhere muffled and deep. Heather woke up and came rushing into my room. I'll never forget her asking, What's happened to Daddy? 
I got out of bed, took our hand, and we put on all the lights in the house we could. First my bedroom light, then the hall, then we went into my dad's bedroom. It was empty. The bed covers were pulled back. Staring at the vacant bed with disturbed blankets, I felt a gnawing in my chest. At eleven years of age, I knew to call the police when there was an emergency, but I didn't right away. I think it was because I hoped to find him somewhere else in the house, that Dad had put his back out and was lying on the couch. That had happened once before. We put the rest of the lights on around the house one by one. I felt like the lights would banish the fear growing inside of me, but they just made the house feel emptier than it should have. What made things worse was the smell. It was bad, especially in the hall. I remembered that smell. I knew that the only way the stench could have been there was if someone had opened the cellar door, even if just for the briefest of seconds. I moved along the hall to that door, Heather's hand in mine, her eyes filled with apprehension, gazing between long strands of red hair her little bare feet making the slightest sounds against the cold carpet. Dad! I shouted at the door, hoping he'd respond. But nothing came back to me, not even another scream. Anything would have been more comforting than silence. I stared at the door, fear swelling inside of me. I knew what had to be done. Heather tugged at my arm and begged me not to go down there. She was right, of course, but I was at that age where I constantly felt the need to prove myself. It would have been easier to have turned away and sought help, but that was not what happened. I leaned down and cupped my sister's face in my hands gently, moving her strands of red hair softly, resting them behind her ears like her mother used to. I looked her in the eyes and said, Daddy will be okay. An empty promise, but it was all I had. Then I instructed her that she needed to go next door to Mrs Reed's house and tell her about what had happened, that they should phone for the police and an ambulance, that Dad was missing and that he'd hurt himself down in the cellar. What are you going to do? she asked, her face cast in incandescent light and fear. I fed her a lie about waiting in the hall in case Dad came back up the cellar stairs, but I watched her reaction as I spoke those words. She didn't believe me, and yet she still did as I asked. Heather opened the front door and headed outside into the night. A rush of cool air came inside before she closed the door, but it wasn't enough to rid the hall of the putrid smell from the cellar. I knew Heather would be fine. Mrs Reed's house wasn't far, just a short few steps out of the garden and through her neighbour's gate. She'd be looked after, and soon the police and ambulance would be there. In the intervening minutes, it was my duty to make sure my father was safe. I took being the oldest child seriously, ever since Mum had died. Dad had drummed into me that if anything should ever happen to him, that I would have to be strong and take care of things. The thought of losing him shot a cold, damp feeling up my spine. When I was certain Heather was gone, I turned and thumped my hand on the cellar door, shouting, Dad, are you down there? I dreaded hearing silence again, but that is not what happened. In return, I did finally hear something. It was the sound of water trickling down there somewhere, shuffling around between the walls and open doorways of the cellar. It echoed slightly like a far-off dream, making me shudder. I imagined my dad clinging for dear life down there as the water rose up and up and up until it was only an inch from his mouth. That thought pushed me forward. I had to save him. I put my hand on the door handle. Turning it, the handle clicked, and I slowly pulled the door open. The stench was overpowering. It made me feel sick. A strange smell of damp and grime, 
and something else I couldn't put my finger on, but a smell I'll never forget. Staring down to the bottom of the cellar steps, the place was in utter darkness. I thought that Dad must have taken the torch with him. I reached up to the side of me where a pull chain dangled from the ceiling. I wrapped my fingers around it and pulled until the lights came on, one solitary incandescent yellow bulb above the stairs, and then the dim glow of a few others in the cellar rooms below, just out of sight. Looking down the stairs, I was shocked. There was no water down there. The bottom of the steps glistened as though they were damp, but I could see the stone floor below them, and they looked dry. Dad, I said again. A muffled sound, almost like a groan, came from somewhere further under the house. I recognised it as my dad's voice again. He was still conscious. Hope rushed through me. Do you need help, Dad? I remember asking. It seems like a stupid question now, looking back, but I remember wanting him to appear and climb the steps without me having to go down there. But again, that did not happen. His voice muffled a few words like his mouth wasn't able to fully form around them, and so I couldn't make them out. In my mind, I imagined him face down on the floor, kneading me. I searched for all of the courage I could find and moved downward. The stone steps of the cellar lay silent as I descended, icy cold against my bare feet. The smell of the place worsened as I reached the cellar floor, making me gag, and I wondered what could make such a terrible smell of damp. Somewhere in the back of my mind I remember thinking, that's what the dead smell like. The dim glow of another light bulb further into the cellar illuminated something to the side of the steps. It glistened differently from anything else. I knew implicitly that it was blood. The sight of it filled me with anxious thoughts. I remembered cutting my head at school once when I fell in the playground months earlier. This blood seemed different somehow to that. More vivid, yet darker. A small puddle of it had gathered on the floor, and then there was a trail of it heading through an open doorway. I moved closer to the trail and saw, to my horror, that alongside it were what looked like bloodied footprints. I could see the impression of the sole and the occasional outline of the toes rendered in the same unnerving red on the cold cellar floor. My eleven-year-old mind had to process everything. I stared at the glistening deep red and reasoned that Dad had gone down to the cellar during the night, barefooted, and then had an accident. Dad, are you there? I said out loud. What I heard from beyond the open doorway where the blood trail led sounded like him, but as though he were drowning, coughing on something, trying to speak, but there was another sound underneath that, like his mouth was broken and unable to work any longer, no matter how desperately he tried to use it to form words. He sounded in unbearable pain, and this spurred me into action. I rushed forward through the doorway, the blood spattering underneath my shoeless feet. The room was completely empty, except for what appeared to be old rags, bundled in the corner, covering something. The bundle was large and wet, cast in red. I realised this was because the nearest light bulb was covered in blood. On the walls were handprints, as though my dad had tried to scramble up them, trying desperately to get to his feet. Or get away, I thought. The rags in the corner moved subtly, almost like Whatever they were concealing, shivered. The stench coming from the bundle was so strong, I would have vomited if it weren't for the fear coursing through me. Then a glint of something shiny caught my eye. It was among the undulating cloth. 
I only saw it for a second, but I knew what it was immediately. It was the dial of my dad's wristwatch. I remember trying to say, Dad, but my voice trembled so much I couldn't get the words out. I couldn't help but fear the worst, that what was moving beneath those rags was all that was left of my father. My mind couldn't quite grasp what I was looking at, and yet I still approached, wanting to help my dad in any way I could. As I neared the bundle slowly, I saw a set of fingers poking out from the mass of rags. They looked yellowed, but they moved, writhing and grabbing hold of the cloth around them like they were in agonising pain. Inside of the mass of material somewhere, I heard Dad try to speak again, but the words remained a broken mess. Tears welled up in my eyes. I couldn't understand what had happened to him. All I could think about was the pain my dad was in. I knew I couldn't wait for an ambulance. I stepped forward and reached out my hand to touch what remained of his. But when I was within inches of touching him, the fingers lurched out from the rags and grabbed hold of my hand. They latched on like fishing hooks, digging their greasy nails into the skin. I let out a cry, first of pain and then of disbelief. The hand wasn't attached to a wrist or arm, but something that resembled bone covered in black mould. I saw the bend in the middle like an elbow, but it moved both ways like a dislocated joint. The rags quivered and slid across the floor towards me as the hand kept me in place. They reached my feet and wrapped themselves around my ankles. Then I saw a mouth with blackened teeth protrude from the bundle and something resembling a glistening tongue licking over them, gasping out a sickening warm and wet breath. I stared in utter horror at the mouth as it spoke words I couldn't understand, the voice of my father still there, but senseless. Then a thought spread across my eleven-year-old brain like an electrical storm. That thing is going to eat me. It slid forward. A sea of hands then grabbed me, but not from the thing on the floor, but instead from behind me. I heard familiar voices, the voices of neighbours, shouting in terror as they tore with their bare hands at the rags, bone and flesh attached to me. I heard another set of footsteps running. Someone then stabbed the thing with a large kitchen knife. I heard the scream again, the scream that had awoken me. My dad's scream, my dad in agony emanating from the blackened mouth at the centre of the rags. The sound of cracking and wet cartilage and ligament tearing came as the grown-ups snapped one of the thing's bones, and with an almighty tug, my neighbours finally wrenched me away from the bundle of rags as it screamed at us with hate. A rush of footsteps sped me off. Warm, safe arms carried me up the steps, the strong arms of Mrs Reed, our neighbour. She held me like I was her own child carrying me at speed out of the dim red-tinged room and into the hallway above. I turned my head and nestled into her shoulders, then saw the other neighbours, four of them, slamming the cellar door shut and then barricading it with pieces of furniture. They backed away from it, as if expecting the thing in the cellar to burst through at any moment. Heather was still next door being looked after by Mr Reed but I was kept close due to my ordeal, pretending to sleep in those safe arms. For two hours, I sat in our house, in the kitchen, listening to the grown-ups talk, their faces filled with expressions of worry and fear. Secret, they said. No one should know, came another. Hide the entire thing, another said. My panicked, traumatised mind couldn't put any of it together. All the while, the thing, the thing that was all that was left of my dad, screamed from down in the darkness, a hungry, agonising scream I will never forget, mangled with the sound of rushing water in the cellar that, from their worried glances to each other, was plainly audible to everyone present.
A plan was set, though I was in too much shock to take it in. They debated what should be done, but seemingly came to their senses eventually. They phoned the police, but by the time the flashing lights came and the officers walked down beneath the floorboards to see what was there, a fresh flood had entered the cellar from the river. When the water was pumped out by the morning, nothing was found. No blood, no thing of rags and bone, no thing at all. My dad was gone. I never shared what happened that night with Heather. What I saw down there in the darkness beneath her home. I didn't want to scare her, to hurt her. She was going through enough as it was. She had lost her mother and now her father. We were orphans. She didn't need to know the rest. The pain of grief would be enough of a struggle. After a police investigation, and due to my dad's body never being found, along with our neighbours trying to persuade me that my memories of the cellar were nothing more than a fevered night terror, the official conclusion was that dad must have run out on us. But I knew better. I couldn't see any situation where he would have abandoned us. The neighbours, they knew even better than that. They knew exactly what had happened far more than Heather or I did. It turns out I was kept in the dark for years. The neighbours hid the truth from the world. They let Heather and I get on with our lives without burdening us with it. I'm still not sure whether they did that to protect us or protect themselves. Perhaps a little of both. We moved away after Dad's disappearance to live with our grandmother and, in time, were able to live a happy enough life though I never forgot what happened. It was etched into my mind forever, along with the sound of rushing water in my dreams. Sometimes it felt as though the black water called to me. In dreams I would imagine it swelling up from deep below my bed and rushing over my body, dissolving me away to nothing. It wasn't until recently, 17 years after the event, that some answer no matter how perplexing, was given for all the horrors swirling in my head since that night. A watch was found by some people doing magnet fishing in the river near our old house. It had an engraving on it with my dad's initials. This discovery was brought to my attention when the police returned the watch to me. I only had to glimpse at it to confirm, without a doubt, that it was his. The same watch I had seen in that mess of bones and rags in the cellar. I was confused by how it could have gotten into the river from the cellar, if indeed my memories were accurate. And the watch, it held another secret, one that urged me to confront the neighbours who had been there the night the water in the cellar had taken my dad away. Through all those years I had thought the neighbours wanted to hide what happened because it was just too strange to be believed. But another possibility had been making itself known in my mind months after the discovery of the watch, that they wanted to hide what happened because of something much darker, something they feared. I called them to meet together, but none of them came, except for the now grey-haired Mrs Reed. She reluctantly agreed, gathering around my dining table in my current home. I laid my dad's watch in front of her, asking her to tell me the truth. I demanded it. I deserved it. Just what had happened to him? What had turned him into that collection of rags and bones? Why was he never found? I wish I had never asked those questions. Some answers can never be forgotten. I'll tell you what Mrs. Reed told me. She said that Dad's life had been one mired in tragedy. Her own mother had died of cancer when Heather was very young. This I obviously knew. I still remembered the overwhelming grief of her loss. But what I didn't know was that Dad had been married to someone else before then. They had even lived in the same house before he met my mother. Dad's previous wife had given birth to a young girl, her name was Orla. 
Orla was born with severe learning difficulties, and Dad always seemed to struggle with this reality. He grew distant from her. It turns out that one day, when still only a young teenager at the time, Orla managed to climb out of the garden, through some woods, and then down to the river. Dad was supposed to be keeping an eye on her. Several witnesses saw her down there, dog walkers, people out for a stroll. They didn't know that, despite being 15 years of age, that she had the mental capacity of a three-year-old. And so they never approached her as she sat on a large rock by the river bank, dangling her feet in the water, smiling happily as the river splashed around her ankles. The worst kind of tragedy then followed. She vanished. Orla's body was never found, despite an extensive search of the river. It was assumed that she had drowned and then her body had been washed miles away, perhaps even out to sea. Mrs Reed said that Dad mourned terribly and then he began to act strangely. He started telling neighbours that Orla was calling to him from the river. He would spend hours down there sitting on the same rock where she had last been seen, even though his wife begged him not to. Though she grieved just as bitterly, she wanted them to get on with their lives as best they could. This was something Dad refused to do. The neighbours would see him down there at the edge of the water. He would talk to his reflection as though he were talking to Orla herself. Eventually, he had a full breakdown and had to be committed. His wife could no longer cope and left him. Mrs Reed stayed close friends with him during that time. She said it took a couple of years for Dad to recover and then something transformed his life. He met our mother at a support group for grieving parents. Yes, I was shocked to learn that our mother had lost a child too. A boy named Sam, killed by a terminal disease not unlike the one that took her from us years later. Dad and Mum bonded, and they helped each other through their pain, eventually having more children, me and then Heather four years later. For a time, they were happy. Maybe they would have told us eventually what had happened in their past, when we were old enough. That once, a long time ago, we had a sister named Orla and a brother named Sam. Before our mother died of cancer, Dad promised her in front of Mrs Reed that he would never go back down to the river once she was gone. She was worried he would have another episode and not be able to look after us. He gave that promise, and to my knowledge, he never stepped foot near that river again. Unfortunately, Mrs Reed revealed that in the months before his disappearance, Dad's mental health issues seemed to be coming back. He talked to her about what was going on with our house. He was fixated on a singular fear, manifested in dreams that haunted him. A fear that if he wouldn't go back to the river to see his daughter, then the river would seek him out. Dad then started to complain about a stench of damp coming from the cellar. But none of the neighbours smelled it when visiting, and they didn't have any issues with flooding in their own cellars. No one else even saw the water, and when I thought about it, I had never seen it either. Despite this, Dad called out contractors time and time again to fix the constant flooding down there. They took his money even setting up elaborate pumping equipment to keep him happy, but they never found a single drop of water down there. The cellar was bone dry. In fact, the only time it did indeed flood was the night I was attacked by the ragged thing beneath the floorboards. The night any trace of my dad disappeared. Mrs Reed ended the conversation by saying the strangest of things. No matter how much I pressed her on it, she wouldn't explain it any further. Paraphrasing, she said, Your father was a good man, but the water in that river is tainted. It flows strangely. It always has. 
A river is only ever as clean as its source, and locals have said for years that it comes from a bad place. I stay clear of it myself. Some of the other neighbours do too. You might think it's superstition, but I'll tell you, that water changed your father that night in the cellar. But make no mistake, it wasn't the first time it corrupted him into being, or even doing, something truly evil. I can't bear the thought of what that might mean. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story. I certainly enjoyed writing it, though sometimes these stories take me to a dark place. And that, unfortunately, is where this one concluded. But where there is darkness, light must be born. And like the main character in our story, we must remember that even in the bleakest of moments, there is the hope that we can all move past the tragedies of our lives and still find joy and happiness and wonder. This is my belief and my hope. I hope it's yours. Well, looks like the storm is passing. Time for you to be on your way once again. But should you climb into your nice cosy bed tonight and hear something from the cellar or basement where you live, perhaps even the trickling of water or a scream, Maybe it's best you don't investigate yourself, for who knows what horrors of your past live down there. Unpleasant dreams, dear listeners. I'll see you again soon for another ghastly tale.